Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Alcohol Beverage Law 101, Regulatory Tools of the Trade. This is Adina Santiago. I'm the head of Hush Blackwell's Regulatory Division of the Alcohol Beverage Group. 100% of my practice is focused on alcohol beverage regulatory licensing and compliance. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to be talking with you today about the regulatory framework of the alcohol beverage industry. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping issues. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application icons for your use during the program today. I'd like to take a minute to highlight a few of the key icons for you. Questions. If you have questions during the webcast, please submit your question via the question box. I will try to answer all questions during the webcast today. And feel free to ask questions as I go along so we can answer questions pertaining to the topic or ask questions at the end. If a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, I'll be happy to answer questions later via email. I truly appreciate audience participation and encourage you to submit questions. There's an also an icon to assist you with your viewing preferences. Accordingly, please note you can expand your slide area by clicking on the Maximize icon on the top right of the slide area or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the Help icon. It has a question mark and provides information regarding common technical issues. A copy of today's slide deck and additional materials are available in the resource list icon that looks like a folder at the bottom of your screen. This program has been approved for Colorado, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, Tennessee, and Texas continuing legal education credit. Wisconsin continuing legal education credit is pending. To report your hours in Illinois, Nebraska, Tennessee, or Texas, click on the CLE widget at the bottom of your screen and complete the questions. A recording of the webcast will be available tomorrow for watching and sharing. Once available, a link to the recording will be emailed to you. Before we get started, there are a couple of things that you may hear me refer to over and over throughout the presentation. The first is the Alcohol, Tobacco, Tax, and Trade Bureau, also known as TTB. This is a federal agency within the Department of Revenue that regulates the alcohol beverage industry. They do the licensing and product evaluation and approval on the federal side. Also, to a lesser extent, the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, which regulates food products and covers alcohol beverages to some extent, but the primary jurisdiction is with TTB. There is some interplay between the two agencies. TTB relies on the FDA and looks to the FDA for food safety guidelines, specifically concerning ingredients in alcohol beverage industry, whether they're considered safe, as well as organic and gluten-free claims on labels, caloric contents, and nutritional fact panels were required. The regulations for the federal practice of alcohol beverage come under the Federal Alcohol Administration Act, the FAA Act, which is Title 27 under the federal regulations. So when you hear me refer to the federal regulations, this is largely what I'm talking about. Also comes into play the Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act, particularly for labeling on some alcohol beverage products. Just a couple of uh, interesting trivia tidbits related to alcohol beverage industry. A shot of whiskey. I always wondered where did this come from? It turns out back in the days when people would go down to the saloon and have a drink after work, if they, they didn't always have money to buy a drink, and a 45 cartridge for a six gun cost 12 cents, and so did a glass of whiskey. So oftentimes people would trade a cartridge for whiskey, and this became known as a shot of whiskey. I find it very interesting that the alcohol beverage industry, the alcohol beverages as a good, are the only good or commodity that not only has one, but two amendments to the Constitution. And each is, uh, was a derivation response to crime and corruption. So the first is the 18th Amendment, which was prohibition. And the second was the 21st Amendment, which repealed prohibition. 
And that's how we end up in the regulatory framework that we're in today. The 21st Amendment, the federal government allowed states to determine how they wanted to regulate alcohol beverage industry, the industry within their state. And that's why we have at least 50 ways to look at the same issues throughout the country. When we talk about alcohol beverages, we talk about three commodities. We talk about malt beverages, beer, and there is a distinction between those two. Malt beverages under the FAA Act are beverages that are produced from hops and malted barley. If they don't have hops and malted barley, they're not considered malt beverages. However, under a different section of the FAA Act, it's considered beer. The federal government regulates both malt beverages and beer, particularly the production and sale of it, but doesn't regulate the, ra the labeling of beer, just of malt beverages. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into the labeling and formulation part of the presentation. We also talk about wine. Wine is beverages from fermented agricultural products, so grape wines, but also from other products such as honey or rice or other fruits. And then we have distilled spirits, which are ethyl alcohol distilled, such as whiskey, rum, brandy, gin, and distilled spirit specialties, which we'll talk about also a little bit later in the presentation. So we said that the 21st Amendment repealed prohibition and gave the states the right to determine how they wanted to regulate alcohol within their jurisdiction. But generally, the industry is a three-tier construct. Uh, you have your supplier tier, and this is something that's been adopted throughout the states. It just has a slightly different way of looking at it. You have your supplier tier. Suppliers are on the domestic side, the producers, the distilleries, the wineries, the breweries, the companies that bottle and mix alcohol beverages, and the importers who bring in products from outside of the U.S. and sell them to wholesalers or to other suppliers who then sell to wholesalers. The second tier is the distribution tier, the middle tier. This is the wholesalers and distributors. They purchase product from the domestic manufacturers and from importers. Sometimes they act as importers and distributors themselves. And then they resell to retailers and vendors. The third tier is the retail tier. And on the retail side, we have two types of retailers. On-premise retailers, those are hotels, restaurants, bars, clubs, taverns, where a patron comes into the premises, orders a drink, consumes the drink on the premises, and then at some point vacates the premises. The other type of retail sales is off-premise retail sales, which is where a consumer comes into the premises, picks their product, pays for it, and then leaves the premises and consumes it somewhere else. For off-premise consumption licenses, you are not permitted to allow somebody to consume on your premises except in very little, limited circumstances which is usually things like tastings and other specific events where they are allowed to do that. With few exceptions, if you're within the alcohol beverage industry or you want to get involved, whether as an investor or as a manager or an officer, you usually have to pick one tier of the system. This is because within the alcohol beverage industry, there's something called tied house laws, which prohibits somebody from being a supplier and also being a retailer. Now notice I left out that distribution tier because some states do allow you to be a supplier and a wholesaler, but not a retailer. And other states provide that you can only be one of those three tiers and could not also be a supplier and a wholesaler. Um, when you become, when you pick your tier, you kind of got to stay in that lane. And, or, and then divest yourself within one tier in order to join another tier. This is so that you don't have a situation where a supplier, only one supplier's products are available at a retail establishment to the exclusion of other suppliers' products. Also note that in addition to federal regulations, the states regulate alcohol beverage as well. They issue licenses of their own. And on the retail side of it, 
it's not only the state, but often the county and the city that will get involved in the regulatory framework. Licensing in one state means you have privileges to sell or purchase, distribute, produce, whatever that you're doing within that state only. If you then want to make your products available in another state, additional licenses are usually required. There are two types of regulation amongst the states. There's the control state. In a control state, it's a monopoly system of the alcohol beverage sales. The state controls the purchase and sale at the distribution tier and often at the retail tier, mostly of spirits and in some cases wine. About a third of the states remain control states to some extent. Some examples of those states are Pennsylvania, Utah, Virginia, Michigan. Over the year, recent years, there's been some opening up of some control states. Washington is an example that a few years ago was control for spirits, and now they have allowed some privatization. In contrast, you have the license states. The license states allow private enterprises to buy and sell alcohol beverages at state discretion and pursue it to state, county, and city-issued licenses with specific privileges. About two-thirds of the states are open states and operate as private license states. Some examples would be New York, Texas, California, and those states issue licenses to private enterprises to allow them to conduct certain activities. I have a question here. How does the three-tier system reconcile with suppliers owning distributors? So, like I mentioned, there are situations, there are states that allow you to be both a supplier and a distributor. So we talked about the federal government. The federal government issues permits and registrations on the supplier and wholesale tier. If you want to produce beer, you get a brewer's notice for beer from beer production, beer manufacturing. If you want to produce distilled spirits, you get what's called a distilled spirits registration. And if you want to be a winery or, or be a wine producer, you get a bonded winery or a wine seller registration. As a bonded winery, there's some expectation that you will be producing some kind of wine. In the wine category, other than the fermented uh, agricultural products like grape wine, apple wine, often known as cider, sake, things like that, you also can have wine specialties and other than standard wine products, which is a wine base but is mixed with other things. If you're going to import product from outside of the U.S., you get an importer basic permit. And if you're going to either buy from an importer or buy from a domestic manufacturer and then resell to other companies within the United States or export, you get a wholesaler basic permit. The state licenses correspond to these federal licenses. Sometimes the terminology is slightly different, but overall, they coincide. The retail tier isn't specifically regulated by the TTB, but retailers are supposed to register with TTB. Retailers are licensed primarily by the state, sometimes by county, sometimes by city. And in some states, the state doesn't issue a license. You get your license just from your town or just from your county or both the city and county. It differs state to state and even can differ in different parts of the state. As the industry evolves, there are some exceptions that have evolved as well where you have producers that can make some limited retail sales, brew pubs, um, distilleries that have tasting rooms and other retail services that are available to a limited extent. But if you're thinking about being a producer that has retail sales, retail privileges, you should check your state laws to, to find out what, what your state allows. Like I mentioned earlier, when you get licensed in one state, that gives you the privileges within that state. If you're, so for example, 
if you're a distiller in the state of Maryland and you want to then ship your product and sell to consumers in New York or California, your Maryland state distiller license only allows you to produce in Maryland and sell to wholesalers in Maryland, with limited exceptions, which we won't get into specifically right now. But in order to sell to consumers in California, you would have to get a shipper permit, and those are also called different things depending on what state you're talking about. You get a shipper permit to ship product to the state of California to wholesalers in California. And then the wholesalers in California sell to the retailers in California. Again, this goes back to that three-tier system. Suppliers sell to distributors, distributors sell to retailers, retailers sell to consumers. And overall, that is the framework for the entire industry. The same way we talked about the evolving privileges for small producers, the shipping industry has changed as well. So for example, there are currently 43 states that will allow domestic wineries to ship direct to consumers. Most of those states require the wineries to get some type of permit to ship into those states and it's limited to wine that's produced by that winery. There are also a couple of states, a handful of states, that allow either a domestic producer, distillery, to ship distilled spirits to consumers in their state, or in some cases, even an importer or a wholesaler can get that same type of permit and ship direct to consumers. But this is a very limited number. In all, almost all cases, in order to do that, any activities that you want to have in another state requires you to get some other type of permit other than the one that you have from the federal government and also within your state of residence. In addition to the company, oftentimes a company will have people that they want to have making sales or visiting wholesalers. If you're a producer, you want to have people who visit wholesalers and visit retailers to introduce them to your products and encourage them to pick up your products. In order to do that, you have solicitors or salesmen to do that. Many states require you to get solicitor permits for all of your employees who will be soliciting sales and visiting wholesalers and retailers. And as we talked about the shipping, oftentimes you must be a wholesaler in a state in order to get solicitor permits for your employees within that state. The vetting process. So the alcohol beverage industry, as you can see, is highly regulated. The vetting process involves a review of people, places, and things. On the people side, the regulatory agencies are interested in who manages the business, who's responsible for operational decisions, and who has a financial interest who's investing money, and who's getting money from the sales of alcohol beverages. The threshold for ownership depends, each state has a different threshold for ownership. On the federal side of it, as a general rule, if you own 10% or more of voting or financial interest in a company, you will need to be reported and vetted by the federal government. On the state side, there are states that have no threshold. If you have any ownership interest or any interest through any means in, 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 in a company that ha makes, makes alcohol beverages or sells alcohol beverages, you would need to be reported. Places. This is the premises, the licensed premises. There are federal rules as well as state and local rules about the place where you conduct your alcohol beverage business. On the retail side, it often involves distance requirements. So if you're within a certain distance of a school or a church or another place of worship or somebody's home, you may not be permitted to use that premises for sales of alcohol beverages. Sometimes on the wholesale side, you have those requirements as well, although this is less often. On the production side, there may be rules and, well, let me take a step back for a second and say that in general, also, the property that you want to use for your premises for alcohol beverage sales must be in a commercial or mixed zoning district. 
if it's, re if it's entirely residential, it's not likely to be a place where you could set up an alcohol beverage business. One of the things that comes along with being licensed and permitted by the alcohol beverage regulatory agencies is that they're not going to go into somebody's home, and they do have the right to go and inspect any licensed premises. And so generally, you can't use your home or a residence as your place of business for alcohol beverage purposes. And then things. So in addition to looking at who the people are who are involved in the business and the premises where those activities are being conducted, the government also looks at what are you making or what are you selling. We talked a little bit about label approval and formula approval, and we'll talk some more about it as we go on. But the federal government does review labels for all alcohol beverage products, with few exceptions and oftentimes we'll review the formula for the product that's being produced as well. This pertains to domestic products as well as to, to foreign products. In addition, many of the states have brand registration requirements. Once you get your label approval and formula approval by the federal government, you then also take those approvals to the states and often have to pay a fee and register those brands and those or often specific products with the state governments that you're shipping into. So let's talk a little bit more in depth about those vetting processes. Eligibility requirements for getting a license. Every state differs, but there are states that have residency laws that say in order to be an alcohol beverage licensee, you or your company or at least one person who is an agent or representative of your company must be a resident of that state. These residential residency requirements are being are highly controversial right now. There's been a lot of discussion about this, and it'll be interesting to see if there are changes in those residency laws over the next months and years. We also talked about the three-tier system and the Tide House laws. So one of the questions almost every application will ask is do you have an interest in another tier of the industry? That goes to the people and it goes to the entity as well. Going back to residency for a moment, sometimes it's not about the individuals, the officers, directors, managers, but will be just that your company has to be either registered to do business within the state where you want to set up your business, your business or you have to have been formed within that state. Oftentimes, it's whether you hold any other type of license at all. Even if you are a retailer and you want to open a second retail premises within that state, some states have rules about how many licenses you can hold. We're seeing an increase, so many states that used to allow for two retail premises are now increasing those numbers to five or seven or eliminating those those numbers altogether, but this is something that's been changing over the years as well. We talked about the place and the premises. So in addition to being within the specific zoning areas, being commercial or mixed development, there's also the premises must also meet zoning laws, local regulations and ordinances that might be more specific than just being in a commercial zoning area. There are lots of things that you go through when you're applying for alcohol beverages. Uh, people have to submit fingerprints and personal information. Like I said, you have to vet the premises and provide diagrams of the premises, specifications, what portions of your building are you going to be licensed. And then there's specific requirements to notify the public that you're applying for licenses. So many states have advertisement requirements. You have to publish in the newspaper and let people know you're applying for a license there, as well as placarding. You sometimes have to post a poster on your premises and let people know that you're applying for a license there. Often these things are required for changes as well, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. And as I said, personal information, fingerprinting, criminal record checks. This, so the, government, the government looks at who has a managerial responsibility, who is investing or receiving money from the, from, the, from the business, 
And then they look at those people and they say, are, do you have good moral character? Do you have a clean criminal record? Are you old enough to be, are you over 21 and old enough to be in the business? Or if you're an employee, there are also age requirements for employees who are going to serve and sell alcohol beverages. And all of these things are considered within the application process. Let's talk about a little bit about labels and formulation. So as I said, every almost every product within the alcohol beverage industry that hits the shelves for consumers to buy or is available in restaurants and bars goes through a vetting process. If you're a domestic producer, you're required to submit formulas for re review before producing your product. If you're an overseas producer and you have, are working with a UN, U.S. importer that will be importing your product into the United States, the importer submits that formula for review by the federal government as well. You also have to have the product properly labeled. There are a couple exceptions. If you are a brewery in Vermont and you only want to sell your product in Vermont, then you don't have to have label approval, but you get an exemption from label approval. And there are different requirements for exemptions than there are for the certificate. We call them Certificate of Label Approval, or COLAs. Applications these days are generally submitted through TTB's online system, and there are mandatory labeling information. We talked about three commodities, beer and malt beverages, wine, and distilled spirits. And the requirements are slightly different for each commodity, but the core requirements are the same. So for each commodity, you have a brand name. That's the name of your product or the name of the specific flavor. Sometimes it's a fanciful name, as we'll talk more about. Class and type. What is in that bottle? What kind of product is it? Is it wine? If it's wine, is it sparkling wine? Is it dessert wine? Is it a specific varietal like Shiraz or Cabernet Sauvignon or Pinot Grigio? On the distilled spirit side, we're talking about things like, is it whiskey? Is it vodka? Is it a liqueur? Is it a flavored vodka or whiskey? Is it tequila? The alcohol content. Every product must be labeled with the alcohol con Well, actually, I shouldn't say that. But um, generally, the products must also be labeled with the alcohol content. And there must be an alcohol content statement that shows the percentage of alcohol by volume. So I've shown you one example on the slide, and there are a couple of other limited ways that you can include that statement on your label. Then the name and address of the responsible party. So this is either going to be the importer who's bringing the product in from overseas, and then the statement would say, imported by. And it would either have the name of the company or it would have a trade name that that company has adopted to use on their labels or for their business in general. And then followed by the name of the company would be the address, not the full street address, but the city and state. If you move, if you move your premises, if you change your address, oftentimes this will require you to get new labels or at least change the labels and go forward using the labels that show the correct city and state going forward. Also on the labels is the net contents. And most of the time, the net contents are in the metric, metric measurement. So liters, um, milliliters, 750 ml is a common size of fill for wine. Uh, one liter, 200 milliliters. And each of the commodities, malt beverages, wine, and spirits also has a list of standards of fill for the, for the product. And that standard of fill, the product, the size that you're bottling your product must meet one of those standards of fill, and it must be included on the label. So earlier this year, TTB actually issued what's called a proposed rulemaking, and they proposed changes to the labeling and formulation regulations. There hasn't been an overhaul of the regulations in a long time, and they still haven't made a decision over what changes they're going to make, 
but they basically issued some proposed changes and they gave the industry an opportunity to comment on those changes. So a couple of the things that we've talked about were things that they've actually propose, are proposing to change. One of those things is eliminating standard of fill. And so they would allow you to have any size bottle for any size product, but you would still be required to notate on your label what the net contents is of that product. So we'll have to wait and see if that becomes something that they do change. We've also talked about making allowances on, right now, if you are a wine producer or a wine importer, there's a little bit more leeway as far as which label is considered the brand label and required to have the mandatory brand information. You'll often see that the back label of a wine has a lot more information because on the label application, the producer or importer has used that back label as their front label or their brand label that has all the mandatory information. And then the front label becomes the back label and is cleaner and just kind of gives you the name of the product and maybe the type of the product. Right now, for distilled spirits and for malt beverages, you don't have that same leeway. The front label is required to be the brand label, and then, the, and then there are other requirements that can be on any label. The brand label contains the mandatory information, and then there's secondary mandatory information that can appear on any other label. So they're talking about opening that up for distilled spirits and for malt beverages as well to allow any label to be the brand label that includes the mandatory information as long as all of the required information is somewhere on the product. One of the last mandatory requirements is the government warning statement. So this is a mandatory requirement for all alcohol beverages. It must have a government warning statement. And for the government warning statement specifically, the type font, font may be no less, no more than 25 characters per inch. So they want it to be of a certain size so that it's easily recognizable by the consumer. There are other type requirements, size requirements for labeling. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty of that today, but uh, those things are available to review in the FAA Act under the regulations specific to each commodity. Other things that they talk about on labels are contrast, that the colors that you use and the type font that you use should be legible and clean so that people can read it and easily figure out what they're purchasing, and that words don't fade into the background because of their color choices. There have been a lot of changes, a lot of things that have been determined to be what's called allowable changes on labels in the last couple of years. Things that are mandatory information that you can make changes, um, information that's not mandatory, you can take it off without needing a new label approval. And over time, that list has grown so that there are more things that you can move and change without getting a new label approval. It's made the process a lot easier, I think, for producers and importers. We talked a little bit about formulas. Unlike labeling, which is required for almost every product, and so actually let me go back for just a second. We talked earlier, I mentioned TTB and the FDA. So in general, TTB regulates labeling for alcohol beverage products. There are a few exceptions to that, and there are a few general category exceptions to that. If you have a wine product or a wine-based product that is below 7% alcohol by volume, TCB will not review the labels for that product, and a COLA approval is not required. Those labels then need to come under the FDA labeling requirements, which are slightly different. And if your product comes into that category, you have to meet FDA labeling requirements, including having some form of nutritional fact, pa fact panel on your label. But the FDA doesn't review the labels and doesn't have to approve them before they go into the marketplace. But if your product is found in the marketplace and does not meet the labeling requirements, your product could get pulled off the shelf. CTB does review all of the labels. Another exception would be if you have a beer product that doesn't meet the definition of malt beverages 
as we mentioned earlier, it is the production of it is regulated by TTB, but the labeling of it is not. So again, those products would come under FDA labeling guidelines, and while nobody would be reviewing the labels, you're expected to comply with the requirements. Some products require formula approval first. The formula approval is a review of the ingredients in the product as well as the manufacturing process. So a standard table wine doesn't require formula approval. A flavored vodka does require, form, does require formula approval. So the importer or the producer of that product would submit to TTB, also usually through their online system, and request formula approval. If you have a product that has flavors in it, and those flavors contain alcohol and are produced by a flavor company, those flavors first need to be approved by TTB independently, and then when you submit your formula for your finished product, you would include the flavor approval number as part of your formula ingredients. You also, when you submit a formula, identify the alcohol content of the finished product, how much you're producing in a batch, like I said, a full list of ingredients, the method of the manufacturer, and sometimes products require a sample. And the sample is submitted to TTB's lab in Maryland. The, pro the samples are tested and reviewed, and then it goes to the formula reviewers to make a determination as to what is the class of the product and how should it be labeled. There are classes of product that don't fit into a specific type. So for example, malt beverages generally are malt beverages or flavored malt beverages. If you have flavored malt beverages, then you submit a formula. And flavor could mean that you actually use sweet potato or pumpkin or raspberries in your malt beverage production, or it could be the use of these flavor ingredients where somebody has created this flavor to taste like something, and those flavors can be fully natural, they can be partially natural and, art and with an artificial top note, they can be artificial, and that, so those flavors are reviewed first and categorized if they're completely natural or one of the other categories, and then those are used in your finished product. So malt beverages that contain those kind of flavors have to go through formula approval and are considered flavored malt beverages. When you have a wine product that's not a standard wine, that's produced just from an agricultural product. So if you have cider that's just fermented apples, you wouldn't necessarily need a formula approval. But if you have a flavored cider where you have fermented apples with a mixture of some created raspberry flavoring, then you would need to submit for formula approval. On TTB's website, they have lists of what products require that formula approval process, what products require submission of samples before you can have the formula review. And if your product requires formula review, once that formula is approved, they will assign a number to it, and that formula number is then attached to your label application. Where you have products that don't fit into a specific category, like we said, flavored malt beverages, what's called distilled spirit specialties. Distilled spirit specialties is a distilled spirits product that isn't a vodka, isn't a whiskey, isn't a tequila, it's a mixture of spirits and other ingredients. Those things require formula approval, and because you can't call it as the class and type, whiskey or tequila or vodka, you, the formula approval will tell you how to, call, how to classify that product. So if it's vodka with natural flavors, then your formula approval will say, this is approved as a vodka specialty, and on your label you must say vodka with natural flavors or vodka with a specific flavor. The same is true of wine products where you have a wine base that's then mixed with other ingredients. In addition to labeling requirements, there are also rules about advertising alcohol beverages, and there's some overlap between those things. 
And usually one of the general rules is in advertising, you need to be consistent with how your product is labeled. For advertising, the name and address of the responsible advertiser is required to be included in the advertising. Whether it's a TV ad, whether it's something in social media, whether it's a print ad in a magazine, you'll often see at the bottom of a print ad the name and address or name city state of the company that is advertising that product. Also, you would include the class and type of the product, the alcohol content. There are exceptions. If you're talking about a general line of products and not a specific product, so you're talking about one brand that has a number of different products, then you would list the responsible advertiser and you might refer to it as distilled spirits instead of the specific class and type of the product. So we talked about all of the things that are required in order to get licensed and all of the vetting procedures in a very high level overview of it. Well, if you make changes to any of those things, most of those changes will trigger another application. You spend a few months, you get all licensed, you're in business for a couple of years, and then you have a change in ownership or a change in officers. That needs to be reported, both to the federal government and to the state agency that regulates your license. If you have a change in a manager, so we talked about having somebody locally on the ground in a number of circumstances, specifically on the retail side of it. If your manager listed on the application changes, that needs to be reported. We talked about using names on your label. That might not be the same name on your company. Same thing, change requirement. Any restructure of an organization, if you convert from a corporation to an LLC, if there's a change in your EIN, it's a reportable change. If you're a producer, one part of the application process is that you identify what is your equipment going to be, how many tanks do you have, where is it located on your premises. All of those things, if they change, need to be reported, even if you add one tank. If I've had clients ask me sometimes, well, how do you keep track of it? If we have a new tank now and then we add another tank in a few months or in a year, what if we don't file it every single time? I mean, as a general rule, you're required to report those additions and, and removals of equipment or changes in equipment, but at the end of the day, you should gen do a general overview once a year or once a quarter and determine what changes have been made that might not have been reported. If you need to move to a li different location or you need to add to your premises, uh, your distilled spirits plant and you, your product has taken off and you need more room to store whiskey that you're aging and you need a warehouse and you want your current bond, your current registration to cover your new warehouse. In order to do that, you'd have to request permission both from the state in most cases and also from TTB. TTB and a number of states allow you to be a producer of wine and spirits and beer at the same premises. So you can have an overlap of the equipment and the operation, but each of those commodities will also have to have a separate segregated area. If you start out as a brewery and then decide that you're also going to add distilling operations to your premises, you have to file what's called an alternation of premises to let the government know that you're a brewery primarily, but you want to alternate as a distiller. Another type of alternation is proprietor. Let's say you're a new company, you're small, you have this great idea for vodka, you're going to produce vodka, you open up a plant, you have your equipment. And then a friend comes and says, you know what, I have a great idea for vodka as well, I want to produce my own vodka under my own name. They get a distilled spirits plant registration as well, but they could get it at your premises. And instead of having a lease, the original company A would be the host distiller and company B would be a tenant distiller. And both companies would have to file something with the government to let them know we're going to be sharing a premises, we're going to be sharing some equipment and operations, but each of us will have a separate area and we're going to keep very close records so that you know on any given day who the producer is at this premises. 
on the retail side primarily, although it does come into play on the, on the upper tiers as well, if you have a change in operations, for example, you opened up your restaurant and you decided you were going to be open till 11 o'clock, and then your business is doing really well and you want to have a couple nights a week where you have late night and live bands and or DJs, but that wasn't communicated in the original operations. Well, you'd have to report those changes in operations as well. Let's say you're an importer and you say, I have these contacts for wines overseas and I want to bring their wine in. So you get an importer basic permit for wine only. And then a few years later, a couple of your wineries say, you know what, we've started making brandy. And we'd like you to be our importer for the brandy as well. Well, brandy is a distilled spirits product. So you'd have to go back to TTB and say, well, now I want to import wine and distilled spirits, and I need to make a change to my basic permit to cover both of those commodities. All of these things are changes that, would gener that will generally trigger some form of filing. Once you are licensed, and you are set up to sell, produce alcohol beverages, you are required to keep records. You keep records of your manufacturing, your production, your purchase, your sales. If you provide samples, if you have solicitors in the state and you provide samples to wholesalers and reta retailers so that they're interested in your product, records of the samples you give out are, are required. If you hold a tasting, we talked about Sometimes tastings can be permitted on an off-premise facility. A, a package store can hold a tasting to interest consumers in new products that they have. You have to keep records of those tastings. We talked about Tide House interest, and I'm going to get into that now as I'm concluding. So in addition to not having an ownership interest in a company on another tier or in a business of an, another tier, Suppliers and wholesalers are prohibited from giving things of value to the retail tier. And those things can be money, it can be trips, it can be entering into other business relationships, equipment, things that the retailer can use in their business, and by receiving it from somebody else, that is something of value to them. So as a general rule, a supplier or wholesaler is not permitted to give anything of value to a retailer, with limited exceptions. And even for those limited exceptions, generally you're required to keep record of the things that you've been given in case anybody questions your practices. Also as a general rule, the records that you're required to be kept to keep are to be kept on your licensed premises unless you get permission from TDB and from the state to keep them elsewhere. We talked about producers. A producer or distributor is prohibited from giving something of value or having an interest in a retailer for the purpose of inducing purchase of the producer's products to the exclusion of another. So you can't give money to a retailer so that they have the startup cost that they need to open their business and say, we're going to give you this money, and we expect that when you open, you're only going to sell our products, the supplier and wholesaler products. That is a Tide House violation. And those come up, we said, with direct ownership interest by acquiring property. In a lot of states, if you're a wholesaler or a supplier, you can't rent property that you own to a retailer for their retail business. You can't provide equipment or fixtures or things that the retailer needs within their business. And you can't co-sign a loan or loan them money. Another area where this comes up is credit terms. As a general rule, most states allow a supplier or wholesaler to sell to a retailer on credit for a limited period. Generally, that's around 30 days, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. You've got to check your state laws to see whether they allow on credit sales and for how long. Otherwise, it's cash on delivery. And if you're a wholesaler and you sell to a retailer on credit, and the retailer does not pay within that credit period, then the retailer, then the wholesaler is required to put the retailer on the COD list. And that alerts other wholesalers that that retailer is not permitted to buy on credit because they owe money and they're past due. And 
From there forward, until that credit is cleared, the retailer must purchase from all wholesalers cash on delivery. We talked about exceptions to Tide House rules. With limited value and in limited circumstances, wholesalers and suppliers can provide things like product displays, point of advertising materials, things that the retailer uses, and also things that pass through to the consumers, like t-shirts or bottle openers. In most states, these things are permitted on a limited basis, limited value, but every state has their rules. Other states say, you can give anybody whatever you want as long as you, so you, Mr. Supplier, you, Mr. Wholesaler, you can give any retailer whatever you want as long as you offer it to all of the retailers. We talked about samples, providing samples to a retailer or to a wholesaler of a new product. Generally, this is limited as to the quantity of free samples you can give and also is usually limited by whether that retailer has purchased that product before. So if you have a line of vodkas and a new flavor comes out and nobody's purchased it before, generally you could offer it to your retailer to try, give them a bottle, but six months later you wouldn't be able to, and they've been buying it for six months, you couldn't then offer them more free samples. Combination packages. This can be a combination of alcohol beverage items, and again, every state has their rules about this. Generally, a combination means a couple different varieties of wines or a couple different sizes of wines, but again, every state has rules about how you can create combination packages and whether they allow you to create combination packages. Combination packages can also be something that's popular this time of year where you have a bottle of whiskey and an ice bucket, or a bottle of wine and a decanter, where it's something that's non-alcoholic, not an alcoholic beverage, is packaged with a bottle of an alcohol beverage, and they're packaged together and sold as a gift set. Some states allow it, some states do not. Discounts and coupons, rebates, all of those things can be construed to be something of value to a retailer. If you have coupons and you allow your retailer to provide those to the consumers, maybe it drives traffic to the retailer. So every state has rules about the kinds of coupons you can provide, how you can offer them to the consumer, and how those discounts and rebates can be provided. Advertising services. As a general rule, a retailer and a supplier cannot co-advertise products. However, a supplier could say, buy my beer at these retailers within your state. As long as the retailers, as long as there's two or more retailers, the name of the retailer is given, but it's inconspicuous compared to the brand name and the product that you're talking about. And you wouldn't include any information specific to the retailer other than the name and potentially the address as long as there's two or more, and you wouldn't include their hours of operation or their price schedules or anything like that. And again, the states have the right to allow that, to allow it with additional provisions and additional restrictions, or to say that they're not going to allow it at all. So check your state rules and regulations and see what they say. A supplier could go into a retail premises and move their product, dust it, shelve it, you know, switch for beer, switch out older stock for newer, for fresher, newer stock, but they're prohibited from touching the products that belong to any other supplier. So only the, only the wholesaler or supplier's product can be moved by that wholesaler or supplier. They can't move anybody else's product. And again, different states have different rules about what they will allow for stocking and rotating products. Retailer associations. So sometimes you have restaurant associations, hotel associations, and as a rule, suppliers and wholesalers could participate within those associations, but they're limited as to what they can provide the participants and attendees and the industry members who, par who participate in those associations. Generally, you couldn't offer to pay for a retailer's travel or expenses to get there or stay there in order to participate in that kind of association. When you have an alcohol beverage 
license and you have a licensed premises, you're limited as to what other products you can sell there, other merchandise you can have on the premises, and, and sell either to other industry members or to consumers. <clears throat> and the final piece of it is the outside sign. So oftentimes you'll see lit up signs. There are rules about what kinds of signs a supplier can give to the retailer. Generally, as long as it's under a certain value, you're, it's permitted as an exception. But again, every state has different requirements about that. Before we finish, if there's any additional questions, I'm happy to answer them. Or you can follow up with me some other time and ask me questions that way as well. Well, it looks like that's all for today. Thank you for joining us. We hope the information provided was helpful for you and your organization. If you have not already, please click on the survey icon at the bottom of your screen to complete our short survey. Your feedback assists us in providing quality future programs. As a reminder, this program has been approved for Colorado, Illinois, Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, Tennessee, and Texas continuing legal education credit. Wisconsin continuing legal education credit is pending. A recording of the webcast will be available tomorrow for watching and sharing. Once available, a link to the recording will be emailed to you. This concludes our webinar. Thank you so much for joining me today.